You know, one of the things, when you ask someone who's been married a long time, like an old couple, not you guys, but an old couple, <laughs> real old couple, and they've been married, and you say, what, how are you happily married? What is it? How do you stay happily married? How do you enjoy one another? They usually say, well, you know, we, we became friends real young, or, and, and we just stayed friends, and you just go, oh, God. <laughs> Or we fell in love and we're just still in love. And you're like, oh, come on. <laughs> What's, what, is, what really is it? You know, is it the money? Is it the what is it? Like what? <laughs> but, but what it is, though, it really is something that early on you opened up your heart, you accepted one another, and you kept that going. You kept open hearts for one another for all of those years. Because as we know, we're kidding about it, but even, even the money will run out. Well, maybe even if the money doesn't run out, the love will run out. And something else, you'll need something else. You know, one of the things that I, that I always wonder, when I see old ministers. All right, I'm not going to ask any questions. When I see old ministers, when I see older ministers, and I see, how do you keep your passion for Jesus? How do you keep your love for Jesus after all those years? How do you keep your love and your passion for the word of God? When I see worship leaders, and I, you know, I've led worship thousands and thousands and thousands of times. I can't say I ever asked the Lord to make me a worship leader. I just, I just was a worshiper because I needed God, to be honest with you. I just needed God. Because if I didn't have God, I'd, I'd run out. And I, I wouldn't have anything else to, to go for. And I just needed God. Then God said, I want you to do this, lead other people in that. And I'm like, I don't really want to do that. It's kind of vulnerable, you know, to lead other people in that. Besides, they don't want to worship you. They don't, people, people, people don't always want to worship the Lord. You do. But not everybody does. So it's kind of hard to sell people like, come on, everybody, worship the Lord, lift your hands. They're like, <laughs> you're like, forget it, put your hands back down, you know? <laughs> you don't want to make people do things, you know what I mean? What you want is you want people to, to, to be passionate about the Lord, to love the Lord. To, I mean, really love the Lord like you love the Lord, but you can't always transfer that. And something that I've noticed also is when you've been in ministry for a long time, you've led worship a bunch of times, you've led the same song like a hundred times, how do you still keep your passion for Jesus and your love for the Lord pure and holy? You know, and there's someone, well, here's what you do, and you go, oh, come on, no, no, don't be so quick to answer it. Because there is something in your life where we have to say, Lord, renew me and renew my passion for Jesus. Let me tell you something. When I went to Memphis, I love the word of God. I mean, I listen to the word of God, not because I have to, because I love the word of God. I mean, I just, I eat the word of God. I listen to, listen to messages. I read my Bible, not because I have to, but because I really enjoy it. And I do, and I feed my heart, I feed my heart. But I found myself about a year year and a half after I got there, and I realized that I was not just going for some like, oh, this is just a great, it was, I'm on, it was like a missionary journey. I was out there, I didn't feel partnership, I didn't feel connection, I felt dry. I, um, I, I, I walked into the room one day, and I see Tiffany in tears, and I'm like, what's going on? It wasn't that she wasn't happy. Come on, she's married to me. Of course not. I'm just kidding. Well, no, but, but I'm saying she's fighting battles. I'm fighting battles. I look at our kids. They're fighting battles. I look at people in the church that are starting. They're fighting battles. And then we got the weather. And then you got, you're trying to start the church and know where to start it and all those kinds of things. And I remember there's things that are going right. But it's not the things you battle that are going right. It's the things that are going wrong. That you have to battle. I remember getting in the car one day. I didn't ever think about quitting because I knew the Lord spoke to me. But I got discouraged. You know what I mean? Got discouraged. And I remember getting on the road and driving along. 
on the road and I just told the Lord, well, Lord, I love you and I don't really know what to do about my heart just to keep it stirred up. And the Lord just spoke these words to me and said, well, you're not worshiping like you used to. <laughs> See, I was listening to the word. I was in the word, speaking the word. De I declare all day long. I was declaring, I was speaking, I had life flowing through me, but there was something just in me, I'm just saying something about me, because something about just having ministry with worship that I just, I was in practices of worship and I would stop and when I start singing to the Lord, I just realized I wasn't worshiping the Lord the way that I did. And there is something where he says in John 15, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, he didn't just say if my words abide in you. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask. Notice prayer is a result of abiding in the Lord and his words abiding in you. Notice he said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask. The result is prayer and it will be done for you, right? So it's, it will be done for you as the end result. You will ask is right before that. But really, having his word abide in you and you abiding in him, abiding in the presence of God. And I'll tell you what, thank God for the Holy Spirit. Amen? Thank God for the Holy Spirit because all I had to do was just like calibrate. I just had to make that little, little adjustment and say, oh, I can do that. I can do that. And I just, you know, I just woke up 15, 20 minutes early, earlier than I normally do. And I just start my day by worshiping the Lord. You know what I did? It fixed everything. All discouragement went away. I mean, I didn't, I didn't have to call a counselor. I didn't, have to, I didn't have to go through this and go through that and go through that. All I had to do was do, just make the little adjustment of starting to worship the Lord, connecting with the Lord in my heart. Because other things were in order. It was just my intimacy, my heart, my connection, my worship with the Lord needed to be calculated. See, sometimes there's certain things we want to do there's certain things that we want to do for the Lord, and we go, Lord, I'll do anything for you. My little daughter, Zoe, she's eight years old. Last year, she came to me, and she goes, Dad, I want to be your assistant. <laughs> I said, well, I could use an assistant like you. And she said, Dad, I'm going to set up a desk at my house. She said, I'm going to set up a desk right by your desk. And, and when you're doing stuff, I'm going to work right by your desk. I said, how about right outside of my office, right because that's usually where assistants will go outside and I can close the door and then you'll have privacy. She said, I like that. I like that. Okay. So she, she, she set up, she set up the desk out there and she got her paper and she got all that stuff. And I said, um, and I said, Hey, uh, uh she goes, uh, excuse me, would you like for me to do anything? And I said, Oh, um, yes. And I'm looking around. I said, Oh, um, uh, Miss Zoe. And she said, yes, yes, daddy. She walked in with her pen. I said, would you, would you empty my trash? And she goes, oh, I'm not your cleaner. <laughs> she's my assistant. She's not my cleaner. I said, okay, I get that. You know, sometimes I'm that way with the Lord. You know what I mean? Like, I'm like, Lord, I'll do anything for you. And the Lord's like, how about that? And you're like... Anything but that. I'll do, I'll do something else. I'll, I'll, do, I'll do anything for you, Lord. You know? But there's something about keeping what the Holy Spirit says in your life as primary in your life. And uh, worship. Let me, I just want to talk with you for a little bit about falling in love with Jesus. And staying in love with Jesus. <laughs> it's one of the most important things. That'll keep you. You know, it makes living for the Lord easy. Sometimes people go, why is it so complicated? Well, let me tell you about marriage. I've been, we've been married for how long? We, how long we've been married? 23, 23 years. We've been married 23 years. So long, it seems like forever. It just seems like forever. Yeah. But, you know, I, I didn't learn how to get married by going and buying that book, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus. 
and studying uh, what you know, studying the motions of a woman or the the this of a woman or the this and that. And I read all about. It and I got together in our first date, and I said, "Hey, how are you doing? Yeah, okay. I just need to go checklist. Okay, first of all, this, this, this." She'd go, "What in the heck are you doing? What are you doing?" No, the way that I got to know Tiffany was to sit down and have a date with her and spend time with her and talk with her. Face to face, just talk with her, spend time with her. And if we don't continue to have face to face time and conversation and talk and communication, our relationship will, and our fellowship and our friendship will end up going right downhill. It's not that we don't have a great friendship and fellowship. If we communicated just through writing, like some people want to communicate with God just through the Bible. If we communicated just through she wrote me notes and I wrote her notes, but I never saw her, I never spent time with her, I never talked with her. Well, if we just communicated through text, but we never spent face-to-face time, there would be something missing in our relationship. See, relationships take nurturing. And I want to, I want to talk with you about, about falling in love with Jesus and keeping Keeping our relationship with Jesus fresh and real, it does make things so simple. It makes things so much easier. It makes things uh, uh, much more simple. And I, I want to I show you out of the book of, you know this, this story in John chapter 4. You know where he says, those who worship me will worship me in spirit and truth. I want to talk to you about the Samaritan woman. John chapter 4, would you look at your screens here? And I have, I'm going to move this here and see how this comes out. I think this will be okay. Yeah, this will be good. Okay. Would you read this with me? Let's read this. It goes, Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left to Judea and returned to Galilee. Where was Jesus going? So Jesus was on his way to Galilee with his disciples, and the reason why is because it was some, the disciples were squawking that that he was about John's disciples that he was baptizing more though it was the, his disciples were baptizing was, was baptizing more people than John's disciples were. Okay, so he was on his way to Galilee, and he had to go. Somebody say through Samaria. So notice his destination wasn't Samaria. His destination was what? His destination was Galilee. Okay. So he was going through Samaria. He was on his way to Galilee and uh, on his way. And eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar near the field that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. So he was on the way to Galilee, but he was making a pit stop in Samaria. Have you ever been going somewhere and you had those pit stop cities you had to stop in, like to take a bathroom break or to, or to, to, to get something to drink or something like that? But those are cities that you just go, let's just get in and get out. You, you, you don't know those cities. You don't have to say which ones they are. Someone in here might live there. Yeah. But you just say, we, we, we never live in that city. In fact, sometimes you go, who lives in this city, right? right? I, that's, that's a pit stop city. It's just a city that I'm on the way through. That was like Samaria. And, and, and Sikhar was most likely Shechem. It was a, a name of reproach, meaning falsehood or drunkenness. It was an area, really, this city was an area that was shunned by Jews. Now look at verse 5. It says, eventually... He came to the Samaritan village, and it says, of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Next verse. It says, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus was tired from a long walk. Now, Jacob's well was there. Uh, Jacob's well was what kind of the city was known for. You ever have cities that you just say, what are they known for? Like, for instance, in Memphis. You know, they say, oh, isn't that where Graceland is, where Elvis was, you know, and they'll say, so, so, I, so you get so tired of hearing like, yeah, Graceland's there, yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> but that's not the only thing the city's about, right? People keep saying, they, they'd come to this city and they say, oh yeah, it's Jacob's Well, that's what the city's about, right? It's kind of a pit stop city, but that's what it's about. It was Jacob's Well is there, right? And it says, and, and Jesus was tired from a long walk and he sat wearily beside the well about noontime. So a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village 
to buy something. Now, I want to point out a couple of things about this. This city was known for Jacob's well, and it's interesting because Jesus hit water was symbolic to Jesus in 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 a few different places. Number one is this. In John chapter 2, remember Jesus' first miracle that he turned water into wine. Well, we know that wine is really a symbol of the spirit, right? It's a symbol of the spirit. We know that in the first verse of John chapter 4 that there was John's baptism, which John was a baptism of repentance, but Jesus was a baptism. He would baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire, So it was a different kind of water. It was a different kind of baptism. But then they came up to this particular well, which was Jacob's well, and they're talking about natural water that they would come to receive from. And what did Jesus, what was he thinking? He was thinking natural water, spiritual water. You're coming for refreshment of natural things, and they're spiritual things. There was something symbolic about Jesus and his ministry with water. If you look at verse Um, He comes to this well, and you look at verse 7. It says, soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Where is that? And it says, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. Keep going. It says, the woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. And she said to Jesus, you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. Why are you asking me for a drink? And Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift that God has for you. Just stop there for a minute. By the way, why did Jesus ask her for a drink? Because Jesus didn't have a bucket. That's just kind of like plain. He didn't have a bucket, and he's sitting there, and he was thirsty. He was tired, and she had a bucket, and he's like, hey, next time you pull up that bucket, can you give me a drink, right? And she's asking, and then she looks at him, and she goes, you're a Jew. Jews don't want to have anything to do with Samaritans. Why are you, basically, why are you here? Second of all, why are you talking to me? Third of all, why are you asking me for a drink for something? Jesus looks back at her and he says, if you only knew the gift God has, notice this. What does it say? If you only know the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. Well, see, this wasn't really common for Jesus because Jews didn't want to have anything to do with Samaritans. Few Jewish rabbis would start a conversation with a woman right? Much less the kind of woman that she was. Look down in verse uh, 10. It says here, Jesus replied, and if you knew the gift that God has for you and you knew who you were speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. Next verse. It says, but sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, Do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I will give him will never be thirsty again. Again, again, notice he's, he's comparing natural water with spiritual water. Those who drink the water that I'll give them will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Look at the next verse. It says, please, sir, the woman said, give me this water, then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Now, I want you to notice This interaction's going on. This woman's wondering why this Jew is talking to him. And he says, if you you knew who I was, you'd ask me for this living water. And she's sitting there and she's going, okay. And she's saying, you never thirst again. Obviously, this woman had some type of thirst going on. Something going on in her life. And Jesus sensed it. Jesus sensed it. In fact, he sensed it because he asked her the next question. He said, go get your husband. And what did she say? She said, I don't have a husband. The woman replied, Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband for you've had five husbands and you're working on the sixth one right now. See, she was thirsty for something. When you're thirsty, when you're thirsty, 
you go looking for a drink from more things than just water. When you're thirsty to fill some, I can't get no satisfaction, right? You're looking for something to fill that void on the inside. You're looking for something that you're hungry and you're thirsty for. How do you keep Jesus as the one that you're hungry and thirsty for? Well, you're hungry and thirsty for something. What do you do, right? She says, go get your husband. And he said, you're right. You don't have a husband for you've had five husbands and you aren't even married to the man that you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. And she said, sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. Go on says, so tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place to worship? By the way, he talked about her personal life. He said, you have five husbands. You're working on your sixth husband right now. And she goes, you must be a prophet. And then she, she comes back and she talks about worship. She comes back and she talks about stepping into some type of how do I connect with God? She's, she's looking to connect with someone, right? Connect with six guys. She's saying, how do I connect with God? She says, you Jews insist that Jerusalem's the only place to worship, while we Samaritans claim it's, a, it's here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worship. And Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, read this with me. The time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. He, she's saying, where is worship? Is it found on the mountain? Is it found in the city? I want to know where I can meet God. And Jesus tells her the answer of where to meet God. He says, I tell you, you Samaritans know very little about worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes, next slide, through the Jews. But the time is coming indeed, and it's here now, read this with me, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Here's the location of worship. So they're saying, is worship found in Jerusalem? Is worship found on the mountain? And he's saying worship's found in the spirit. Worship's found in the spirit. And, we're, and the, the manner in which it's found is in truth. Unveiled, open, honest, pure. If you just be pure, open, honest, and spirit, spirit to spirit. You ain't, we ain't fooling God. In worship, he said that's where it's found. In spirit and the truth, because the Father is looking for those who worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Go on to the next verse. It says, then the woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, and the one who called the Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus said, read this with me, I am the Messiah. Just then, his disciples came back, and they were shocked to find him talking to... A woman, but none of them have the nerve to ask, what do you want with her, or why are you talking to her? Look at this next verse. It says, the woman left her water jar beside the well. Which woman? The woman who was working on her sixth man. The woman who had five husbands, and she's working on her sixth one right now. The woman who Jesus walked into this city who Jews didn't really want to have anything to do with, who he really, it wasn't, only, it wasn't only that he walked into the city, he wasn't even, he was passing through the city. By the way, the disciples didn't even stay around. They, were, they went and got lunch. They went and got lunch, right? They went and got some food. And Jesus is here talking to this, this woman, this Samaritan woman, and he offers her eternal life. He offers, he has a conversation with her. He opens up, he's, he understands her, and all of a sudden, the Bible says that this woman left her water jar beside the well. She ran back to the village telling what? <laughs> telling everyone, come see a man. By the way, could you imagine this woman coming back and saying, hey, I found a man. <laughs> They're like, another man? Is that seven? <laughs> Tony, you found another man? Are we surprised? And they're like, no, she's like, seriously. Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Well, did he tell her everything she ever did? No. She felt that way. 
Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Now look at this. She went back to her village and talked to her whole village about Jesus. This woman who Jesus didn't even pre-qualify. He didn't even make sure she was saved. He didn't even make sure she believed. He didn't even make sure that she had her sins forgiven. He didn't make sure she was baptized. He didn't make sure, you know what he did? He offered her a drink. He offered her eternal life. And what happened? She was tripping out. She dropped her stuff and she went back and became the biggest witness. And what happened? All the people in the Samaritan village came streaming to see Jesus because they're wondering, what is this woman so wild about and so crazy about? What was she so excited about? What, what was she, she so passionate about? This woman was thirsty for something. And what happened? She was looking for God. She was looking for the place of the Spirit. Let me tell you a few things about this. Um, actually, I, 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 I want to read a couple more verses, and then I want to um, I want to bring bring some some uh, some understanding to this. Um, the people came streaming from the village. I want you to look at verse thirty nine. Skip to verse thirty nine from there. It says the people came streaming from the village to see him. There we go. Now, it, it tells about his disciples coming back, but I want to skip to verse 39. I want you to look at this. She went to the village, and it says, many Samaritans, read this out loud with me, would you? Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman. Wait, wait, wait. Many Samaritans, who normally Jews wouldn't mess with, believed because of this woman. Because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. And what did Jesus do now? Could you imagine the disciples saying, how long is he going to take? How long is he, how long is he going to take? I know that sometimes Pastor Jerry would be at the end of services. he would be up here and he'd be praying for somebody. And uh, there's a meeting or something going on. Some of the team would be like, how long is Pastor Jerry going to take? Like, well, he has three more people to pray for. That could be an hour. <laughs> it could be an hour, right? But he's focused on, 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 the, on the people. He's praying for people. He's I'm, just, I'm just giving a, like a regular example of that. That they're, they're wondering, I thought we were passing through Samaria to get to Galilee. How long is Jesus going to take? And notice what happened. It says many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus. And the, the, the disciples just got back. Now right when they get back, all these Samaritans come. And they're like, oh, man, here they all. What are they coming for? And they're like, oh, I believe. And they're like, oh, we got to get out of here. This was just a pit stop. Because of this woman who had, like, working on her sixth. Okay, look at this. Because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, to stay in their village, so what did he do? He stayed two more days. Why don't we stay a couple more days? Why? Well, because there's ministry here. There's ministry here. He stayed two more days long enough for many more to hear his message and to believe. There's a few things that are interesting about the story. I've said some of them, but let me just, let me just read them off. Jesus is on his way to Galilee. He's passing through Samaria, an area that was shunned by the Jews. Jesus stops. He talks to this woman. She's from a different race. She's not Jewish. Besides, she's a woman. Her morals were, were questionable. But Jesus cared about relationships. Listen, Jesus cared about relationships. Jesus cared about one woman because the one woman was the one that was in front of her. Jesus didn't step over one woman so he could reach a lot of people. Jesus cared about the person right in front of him. Jesus stopped and ministered to the person right in front of him. If we can't minister to the person God has sent us, how can we ask him for more? Jesus cared about the person that was right 
in front of him. He cared about the one woman. He cares about relationships. Jesus was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. He crossed cultural barriers. He crossed ethnic barriers. He crossed demo, uh, uh, democratic. He crossed uh, denominational barriers. He talks with the Samaritan woman. He had a conversation with her. Listen what he did. He understood her. He understood her. He understood what her need was. He didn't call her some name. You're with a bunch of, uh, he, didn't, he didn't put her down. He understood her. He understood her need. He read her mail, so to speak. He knew, he knew her. He, he knew about her life that she had these multiple husbands. But he offered her living water. He offered her salvation. He showed her the path to the Messiah. He showed her path to the Father. But she drops her path, she drops her pot, and she goes and she runs and tells all of her Samaritan village. And she says, he told me everything. Here's my big question in this whole story. And I've sat there and I've looked at it. And I've wondered this. Why in the, what in the world was she so passionate about? What in the world was she so excited about? Was it that he had a word of knowledge? Was it that he like told her, I mean, he told her about her life? What, was, what did she do? Slept with a bunch of guys? What was her life? Had a bunch of husbands? What was she, what was she so passionate about? What was she so excited about? Here's, here's what I really believe it was. It wasn't only the fact that he understood her and that he knew her. It was that in the midst of knowing her, he still loved her. See, when you understand that not only does God know you, he gets you, he understands you. He not only can tell things about you, but in the midst of all of your junk and stuff, he still invites you in. He still offers you, uh, 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 he, he welcomes you to the table. He pulls you in. And when you realize that, you know what it does? It unlocked her. It unlocked something in her heart, and she realized, I've never met a man like this before. I've been with men but I've never met a man like that before. I'm sure she's thought that. I've never been with a man. I've never seen a man like this before. The big question, why was she so excited? Because she didn't really do anything special. Even when someone tells you personal things, why was she so excited? Because he knows her, but he still loves her. Could it be that the woman had all of these uh, men in her life, but she had rejection in her life? She'd been turned away in her life, and all of a sudden, someone came, and they said, gosh, I know everything about you, and I still love you. She felt accepted. She felt loved. And you know what he did? He talked to her about worship. It's, it's the passage we go back to over and over, the passage in the New Testament that we go back to. And it was Jesus talking to a woman who had five husbands and working on her sixth. It was that woman that he's talking to about the father seeking worship. And that's the one. That's the one like the Bible chooses to say, this is how God wants to teach worship. To who? To the holy? To the righteous? No, to the open. To the hungry. To the hungry. To the hungry. Why is this man talking to me? I'm sure she's wondering. Why is this man treating me normal? He knows me, but he still loves me. Why is he inviting me into a conversation? Why is he inviting me to take a drink spiritually so that I don't ever thirst again? There's something different about Jesus. There's something that unlocked her. He disarmed her. She dropped her jar and she went back. Maybe this woman had all these guys, but she'd never met someone like Jesus. Jesus doesn't only know you. Jesus loves you. Jesus doesn't only know you, he loves you. Jesus loves people. I want to remind you of something. It says in the book of 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. You know, we talk about loving God more, and I, I, I think the key to loving God more is this. It's not to love God more. If I was going to teach someone just about worship and I was going to say, worship God more, it wouldn't be this, try harder.
It wouldn't be this. Come on, sing louder. Try harder. Get on the ground. Put your nose on the ground. <laughs> See how ridiculous that could sound? God doesn't care about all that. If I wanted to teach someone about worship, and it was just something simple, I think I would probably go back to this verse and say, we love him. Read it with me. We love him. See, we only love to the capacity that we're loved. We can only love to the capacity that we're loved. And if we have a difficulty with loving God, it's because we have a difficulty of receiving the love of God. We can only love to the, to the, to the degree that we receive the love. In fact, look at the, the verse uh, where Jesus was commenting on the sinful woman uh, weeping at Jesus' feet and his disciples didn't really understand it. In Luke chapter 7, verse 47, look at this. It says, I tell you, read this with me. I tell you, Jesus is saying this to his disciples. I tell you, her sins, and look at what Jesus said, and they are many. Wait, 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 just stop right there. Did you, <laughs> is that fun? How'd you like to be that woman? <laughs> she sinned a lot. <laughs> And her sins, and they are many, look it, have been forgiven, so she has shown me much love. I want you to notice, many, many sins, much love. Can I tell you, it's easy to love the Lord when you realize all he's done in your life. It's easy to love the Lord when I just remind myself the place I, I've been so many times in my life, not slipped and fell, walked away. Not unconsciously, consciously. Made decisions to go the wrong way. And I've called out for mercy and God's every time has pulled me back in. Every time has known right where I was. And what did he do? Just like the woman. See, I, I, I look at that woman, I can relate. He, just like the woman, he looks and he says, it's not that you have all your junk together. It's not that you have all your stuff together. But I want to tell you, I'm going to unlock you because I want to tell you, I accept you right where you are. I didn't even, notice Jesus didn't even ask her to change. Now what I'm not saying is that like the woman caught in adultery? You know, someone says, so are you saying he can just keep sinning? Let's just set that aside for a minute. No, he did say, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He did call it sin, and he said not to do it anymore. But listen, he said, let's start with, I don't condemn you. Let's not start with go and sin no more. I think sometimes as believers, we want to start with the, let's get them right. And then once they get right, then God will love them. No, oh, God will love you in the midst of all your crap. God will, God will love you in the midst of all your junk. God will miss, love you in the midst of all your stuff. He'll accept you. He'll invite you for a drink of cold water. He'll invite you right in to worship the Father, to be close. He'll invite you right in. That's what it's all about. Her sins were many but they've been forgiven, so she has shown me much love. Notice this. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. See, I'm convinced that the only problem we have with people having a hard time worshiping, I mean, I'm convinced of it, is they're just not aware or they forget. They forget because I've been there. You ever been there? I forget how life would be without the Lord. So all I have to do is stop and just call back to my remembrance. That's why it says, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Bless the Lord and forget not all his benefits. What does it do? If you stop and you, in fact, just right now, just for remember, he forgives all my sins. You just stop and you think about how good God is, how much is mercy, how much is grace, how much is he's helped you, how much he's forgiven you, how much he's loved you. And you call those things to remembrance and what happens? Well, worship just comes back and flows. Worship just comes back and flows. But Jesus, 
didn't overlook the Samaritans. I don't want to forget about the Samaritans. He didn't overlook the Samaritans. I want to read a couple more verses here about the Samaritans just to close that gap when I said I wanted to skip over that gap. Because I wanted you to see what the disciples who walked with Jesus did. Look at uh, uh, John 4, 27. I just want to read these verses right in between. It says, just then his disciples came back and they were shocked to find him talking to a woman. But none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? Verse 28, it says, And the woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village, telling everyone, Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? Verse 30, it says, So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Now I want you to notice the disciples' reaction. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, you didn't eat lunch. They were not connected. No, these are the apostles. These are like the guys who walked with Jesus. Rabbi, what? Yeah, do you have something to tell me? You forgot to eat lunch. Look at that. He says, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you don't know anything about. Did someone, they're looking at, did someone bring him food while we were gone? (laughs) See, they're like, let's get lunch and get out of here. We, we're going to Galilee. Someone bring him food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other. Look at verse 34. Then Jesus explained. Jesus explained. Listen, boys. My nourishment comes. Read it with me. From doing the will of God who sent me and finishing his work. Look at verse 35. Read this last verse with me. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest. But I say, wake up. And look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. See, you think you're just passing through a pit stop to get to your ministry. (laughs) You say, when am I going to get to my ministry? Right now, I want lunch. Right now, it's lunchtime. When am I going to get to my ministry? And Jesus is going, my lunch is the Samaritans for a couple more days. I want to reach them all. Jesus just didn't overlook people. He just didn't overlook people. There was something in my heart, and I have two more verses to, show, to share with you. There was something in my heart, and I know it's a word for us tonight, that the Lord shared with me about three weeks ago. And it has to do with Jesus loving people. It's the term worship intercession. Worship intercession. It de- In fact, logically, it doesn't really uh, look at it. Worship intercession it seems like two different things. Worship is between me and God. Intercession is interceding for someone else. I don't really understand. Worship intercession. And the Lord kept putting these two words on my heart. Worship intercession. There's something about bringing the presence of God into a place, into an atmosphere, into a city into a home, into a neighborhood that unlocks people. That unlocks the hearts of people. Worship, intercession, worship, intersection, intercession. It's like worship evangelism. It's going to draw the lost. Romans chapter 2 verse 4. I want you to, don't check out right here at the end. Romans chapter 2 verse 4 says, Don't despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering. not knowing, read this with me, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. Anthony, come up here and play something in the... Not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. The goodness of God leads you to repentance. I tried to run away from God. I tried to run away from God. And I can't. 
I've tried multiple times in my life to walk away from the Lord. I've tried. But I can't. There's something about the goodness of God that chases me. There's something about the goodness of God that reminds me I don't have anyone else. Lord, to whom shall I go? And what happens? The goodness of God causes me to make a U-turn. There are loved ones that you have. There are friends and family and neighbors and people in your neighborhood and, and people that you have and you're wondering, how, does, how do we get God to get a hold of them? And I believe there's something about the release of love, the release of worship, the release of the goodness, the release of the presence of God, the release of the acceptance of God, even before they repent. The goodness of God comes first. Notice the goodness leads you to repentance. Repentance doesn't lead you to goodness. But sometimes we, we think it in our minds. If I repent, then I get the goodness. And God says, I'm going to show you my goodness. And it's going to cause you to make a U-turn. Look at it in, in the the. Passion Translation, it says this. Do the riches of his extraordinary kindness make you take him for granted and despise him? Haven't you experienced how kind and understanding he's been to you? Do you realize that all the wealth of his, read it with me, extravagant kindness is meant to melt your heart and lead you into repentance? Come on. Would you right now receive the extravagant kindness of God? No, I mean the covenant has said extravagant kindness of the Lord. It's nothing novel. It's something a little kid can understand. Would you just say, Lord, I receive the, the love of the Lord that maybe I've been bound and I've been locked up with tradition with law, with rules. When I come around, even Christians, sometimes I can feel judgment, maybe not even from what they're saying, but from something in my past. And God, today, I need you to cleanse me and wash me. And if that leads you right now to something that, that you need to repent of, just say, Lord, and I repent. Wash me. Clean me. Wash me. Thank you for your extravagant kindness. Come on, would you call out to the Lord right now? Thank you for your extravagant kindness. In fact, would you say it over your loved ones? Think of somebody that doesn't know the Lord. Think of somebody. We're talking about answered prayer. Think of somebody that doesn't know the Lord right now and say, God, I pray for your extravagant kindness to surround them. I pray for your extravagant mercy, your extravagant goodness and your love to surround them, to cover them, to watch over them, to flow over them, I pray today. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I pray. It's God's goodness that leads us to repentance. The second verse I want to show you is Psalm chapter 42. Psalm chapter 42, and this is the scripture the Lord said to me when I, when I was asking the Lord about worship intercession. Listen, it says this. Read these four words with me. Deep calls unto deep. Read it with me. Deep calls unto deep. See, there's something in the depths of this woman's heart that was deep. She wasn't just trying to have a casual conversation. She was trying to find satisfaction. She was trying to find something to fulfill her soul just like you and me. Just like everyone you know, they're not trying to reject God. They just don't know he's the answer. If they knew he was the answer, they wouldn't reject him. Their eyes are just blinded. Deep calls unto deep, listen, at the noise of your waterfalls. See, there's something about worship. 
There's something about worship. All your waves and billows have gone over me. There's something about the presence of God. There's something about the presence of God that the depths in your heart call out for the depths in God's heart, that your heart wants to touch the heart of God. Look at it in this next translation. It says this, deep calls to deep, read it with me, in the roar of your waterfalls, all your waves and breakers have swept over me. There's something about being in the presence of God that you just feel washed over. All of the arguments It disarms you. The presence of God disarms you. Sometimes we have to know, quit arguing with people and start loving them. Quit arguing with people and start telling them how much the Lord loves them. Quit arguing with people and pray the presence of the Lord. But in that workplace where you feel tension, walk in there before everybody else. And just pray the presence of the Lord over that place. Bring the presence of the Lord into the environment. Bring the presence of the Lord into your homes. Bring the presence. Quit trying to fight with family members. Quit trying to fight with your spouse. I'm trying to convince them. I'm trying to tell them what the word says. I really believe what the Lord's saying tonight. Is the Lord wants to unlock a lot of people. He wants to unlock masses of people in this city, in the cities around. And he's going to do it through his extravagant love, his extravagant kindness, his extravagant goodness. Deep calls unto deep in the roar of your waterfalls. Look at this one more. It says here in that Passion Translation. It says, my deep, read this with me, my deep need calls out to the deep kindness of your love. Read that one more time. My deep need calls out to the deep kindness. In fact, would you just pray that to the Lord right now? Come on. Just open up your heart. Say, Lord, my deep need. I don't know what your deep need is. I don't know what your deep need is. But say, God, the longing in my heart, the loneliness in my heart, the emptiness in my soul, the thing I'm Maybe there's someone in here that's been drinking and you're trying to fill that longing. You've been been looking at porn. You've been looking at drugs or looking at other things to fulfill. Maybe it's just something that you may even think is innocent, like movies or, or media, and you're trying to fulfill maybe a relationship and you're trying to fulfill that emptiness in your soul. But Jesus said, come to me. And you'll never thirst again. Say it with me again. My deep need calls out to the deep kindness of your love. Your waterfall of weeping sent waves of sorrow over my soul, carrying me away, cascading over me like a thundering cataract. We all have something in our hearts that want to connect with God. Judgment denies access. But mercy, love gives people a seat at the table. Deep calls unto deep. I believe that this is the sound, this worship, this presence of God, this inviting people into the presence of God is bringing people and allowing people to come and experience the goodness of God and the presence of God. In the book of Acts, I want to say one more thing. In the book of Acts chapter 2. The Bible says they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly, do you remember what happened in suddenly? It says suddenly, it says a sound came from heaven. I'm not going to go into all this like it's some thing like you go, whoa. But do you know what the Greek word for sound is? It's echo. Echo. Hello, 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 hello. An echo came from heaven, from heaven, started in heaven. Something they were doing on earth opened up a portal in heaven. Something they were doing on earth. See, see, we experience, I experience it because I get up in the mornings. 
People go, oh, I just felt the presence of God so much. And I say, they, did, did you? And I go, oh, yeah, that was really good. Have you felt that in a long time? And I want to go, this morning. And it's not because I'm special, because anyone can do it. I promise God doesn't love me more than he does anybody in here. In fact, if I had to evaluate, I'd say he loved me a lot less than half of you. And the other half maybe a little more. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's not true. But I can just tell you that God has, that doesn't have favorites. He, he allows everyone to come to the table. And there's something about opening up our hearts that opens up the portal to heaven that allows the spirit of God, that allows. In fact, right now, would you do it? He says, look at this, the psalm. Or Acts. Could you, could you just put up Acts chapter 2? Let's put up Acts chapter 2. Sorry, I didn't. I want you to look at this. Suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, an echo from heaven. As of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And what happened? It says, and they begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they're dwelling in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation. And when the sound occurred, that's not echo, that's a different sound. When the sound of them speaking out, these, these heavenly language, this heavenly language, when the sound occurred, multitudes came together. Multitudes came together and were confused because everyone heard them speaking in his own language. There's something about a gathering together in unity and worshiping the Lord. I want us to do this tonight. Would you just take your hands, open them up to the Lord for a moment. You just say, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I open my life up to you today. I worship you with a pure heart. Deep calls unto deep. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. Your goodness. Your goodness is running after, running after me. Somebody needs to know you're forgiven today. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. Let's open up. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me all my days. I am held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God Just you tell the Lord, remind yourself, come on In all my life you Would you enter in? Enter in. Just enter in right now. I enter in. Say it to the Lord. I enter into your presence right now. I enter into the presence of God in this house tonight. I enter into the presence of God. I enter into the Holy of Holies by the blood of Jesus tonight.
Sing of the goodness of God. 